Inflammation is considered the number one cause of death. But what really is inflammation? We hear about anti-inflammatory diets or certain foods being more anti-inflammatory than other foods. But what does that all really mean? In this conversation, I will share and show why an all meat carnivore diet is the best anti-inflammatory diet for you to reduce inflammation. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And that often starts with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. All right. So this talk is going to discuss the anti-inflammatory benefits of a carnivore diet. Okay. So before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone understands. I will give you the slides after this discussion. You can look in the show notes and grab them, but I will say that for every slide, you will see the resource topic citation study that I've used to come up with the content. So you are always welcome to look down here. I'm not going to cite every single thing that I talk about, but I just want to make sure that we are on the same page of what is truly inflammation. So let's level set. Let's make sure that our semantics, our words, our terminology are the same. So what is inflammation? It's the body's natural protective response to damage in or on the body. It's the response to a potential harmful invader. So when threats are received, the immune system goes into attack mode to remove the harmful stimuli and then begin the healing process. Duration of inflammation, there's two kinds. There's the acute. So acute is very short-term threats such as injuries and infections. And then there's long-term. So we were never meant, the body was never meant to deal with never ending barrage of threats that we subject our immune system to every day. This includes chronic stress, ultra processed foods, environmental toxins in our homes that may be from water damaged buildings or VOCs. Chronic inflammation is when it lasts for months or years and it causes the inflammation to consistently perpetually occur. These are some of the most common sources of inflammation. If you see major causes of chronic inflammation is gut dysbiosis, leaky gut, toxins, infections, environmental factors, mitochondrial dysfunction, inadequate sleep, insulin resistance, excess stress, AGEs due to elevated blood sugars, which is advanced glycation end products, and then poor diet, ultra processed foods, seeds, and vegetable oils. And then what happens with chronic inflammation? That's that low dose, low grade, constant inflammation that our bodies and immune system was never intended to deal with. This is how then chronic inflammation perpetuates. You get pulmonary disease that affect the lungs, autoimmune, bone and joint disease, cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetic complications, metabolic disorders, neurological disorders, including depression and Alzheimer's. These chronic illnesses all have in similarity that they have chronic inflammation as an underlying factor. So how does inflammation work? Well, step one, the body first isolates the harmful invader or damaged cells. Then the immune system clears away the dead cells and other damaging debris and substances. That's very similar to how autophagy can work. And then the immune system begins the repair process. So the next few slides, we'll talk about the details of how inflammation works for different illnesses, just to show how inflammation, again, is a common underlying factor for all of these illnesses. In cancer, as you'll see, chronic inflammation can cause gene mutations in healthy cells, leading them to become cancerous. Then cancer cells lure immune system cells into the tumor, resulting in tumor growth, and recruited immune cells help grow blood vessels within the tumor, which then causes further gene mutations. Type 2 diabetes, so insulin, which is a pancreatic hormone, allows glucose to move from the blood into the muscle cells for storage. That's why people with bigger muscles tend to be able to tolerate more amount of carbs. So with type two diabetes, the body does not use insulin well, also known as hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance, or the pancreas does not make enough insulin. So then glucose stays in the blood, builds up leading to higher blood glucose levels, and then excess fat itself can contribute to insulin resistance. Fat in the bloodstream can build up inside the muscle cells, blocking insulin from letting glucose get into the cells. Fat in the bloodstream is typically triglycerides. Then we see pro-inflammatory cytokine levels, which are the signaling proteins in the immune system. Inside the fat tissues, these cytokines become elevated. So having excess body fat triggers inflammation in the body. 
And this leads to buildup of more cytokines in the fatty tissues, which then prevents insulin from even more proper function. So once insulin resistance is present, insulin resistance will cause further inflammation. So this results in a vicious cycle of inflammation causing insulin resistance. In the 1800s, the average person consumed about 22 pounds of sugar in a year. So that was about 27 grams per day, which is equivalent to one medium banana. In 2009, the average now became 176 pounds of sugar per person. And if you were to do the math, that equivalent of sugar is eight medium bananas. That's a huge difference. And arguably, people say that Alzheimer's disease is often considered type three diabetes. Regardless of what causes diabetes, let's just talk numbers and logic, how to understand disease and how to make it make sense so that you can change behavior. So if we understand that the normal blood sugar level is tightly regulated between 80 milligrams per deciliter and 120 milligrams per deciliter, we know that every time we're consuming carbohydrates, our blood sugar goes up and then insulin comes, which is the hormone released from our pancreas to come down. And then we sometimes will have a dip in energy. So then we feel grouchy, we feel sleepy. These are signs of blood sugar dysregulation. So then we consume carbs, which will then give us a, another hit of energy. And over time, our body stores that extra energy and we are not able to tap into it because insulin is that lock. Okay, so what does 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter mean in terms of sugar? The body has about five liters of blood. That's four grams of sugar in the blood at any given time. That means that there is less than one teaspoon of sugar in the blood at any given time. I know that our bodies can consume more than one teaspoon of sugar in a meal, but think about if we in the 1800s were eating a banana, maybe one banana's worth of sugar a day, and now we're consuming eight on average, but probably more than that for the average American. What happens when we're consuming 200 grams of carbohydrates, including sugars per meal? What does that do to the body when normally the blood has four grams? Four grams. 200 grams per meal. Imagine what that's doing to insulin. Imagine what that's doing in your blood glucose. It's just some logic to think about. 34 million Americans suffer from type two diabetes and type two diabetes is a hundred percent reversible with diet. So this slide talks about high carb foods again, shows you what it does to insulin. And then it also shows you how cortisol plays a role. So if you are in balance with your hormones you may want to consider your diet. Cortisol is not impacted just by your diet, but it is a big proponent of it. So if your blood sugar levels go high up because you had a carbohydrate rich meal, then insulin has to come and save the day because your blood sugar again is tightly regulated in between that 80 and 120 milligrams per deciliter. If you see protein also has an insulogenic effect. It's not that much. And then there's fat, which there is an insulinogenic effect. It just takes a much longer time when there is not enough blood sugar or the body feels stressed, or this whole process is inundated and stressed out. The body then starts using cortisol to also help manage this whole process. Well, if we touch cortisol too much, then cortisol, which is supposed to help manage our stress levels, it's supposed to help in a fight or flight mode, then is activated way too much than is expected. And then there are so many downstream effects. This is your entire endocrine system. This is where how all of your hormones and thyroid function together. And if you see right here, within this little adrenal section, there is if we were to zoom into adrenals, one pathway that adrenals support is the cholesterol hormone pathway. So if your cortisol is needed more than anything else, instead of going down these paths to produce DHEA, testosterone, progesterone, it will go this pathway and produce more cortisol. So what happens if we don't have enough cortisol to manage our blood sugars? Well, there goes your DHEA, your sex hormones producing babies, and other ways to look at cholesterol and how steroid hormones are produced from cholesterol. A lot of these are produced within the body, but if you think about it, when we give an abundance of fatty meats, it will support this whole function to function better. 
So it manages glucocorticoids, which is your blood sugar, the cortisol, mineral corticoids, which is the electrolytes, and then your sex hormones. This slide talks about the different minerals that are needed for proper hormone function. If you look at every single thing, whether it's a steroid hormone from cholesterol, thyroid hormones from iodine, as well as tyrosine, tyrosine is an amino acid. So if you don't eat enough protein, and then if you don't get enough iodine, there goes your production of thyroid hormones, amine hormones, peptide, iconocytes, all of these are produced by fatty acids and proteins, not really from carbohydrates. Okay, so the next section is inflammation on the brain. So oxidative stress, simply put, is just too many free radicals. Think about whenever you're consuming something or exposed to something that is not natural, either you will ingest unstable molecules that then just cause these excess free radicals. And so the goal is that then you eat anti-inflammatory foods that dampen down that free radical. So insulin resistance then restricts the brain's access to energy. The brain becomes insulin resistant. Leaky gut, leaky brain, diabetic blood, often diabetic brain. So when there's too much sugar in the brain, the sugar starts sticking to proteins and lipids and the cells stop functioning as well. And then there's dysfunction in DNA expression, which then causes or creates advanced glycation end products. The brain is about 60% fat. Ketones have no issue crossing the blood brain barrier. So ketones can meet about two thirds of the brain's total energy requirement so if your brain is having a hard time using glucose, there is another fuel option. And when we are reducing the amount of sugar we're consuming, we have less inflammation overall, which would then support the brain to get the fuel it needs with ketones and then support the body with less inflammation, less noise so that the body can function more regularly. Inflammation also affects mental health and gut health. There is a connection between depression and gut health due to the gut brain access. Poor gut function contributes to a stronger inflammatory response. There is a connection between depression and diet. Systemic inflammation is considered a root cause of depression. Leaky gut, leaky brain. If antidepressants or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so the medicines that magically make serotonin stay in your brain, if that was a true healing, for depression, then everyone taking an antidepressant should be fixed, but we're not. In fact, the number of people treated for depression has tripled 10% of America is on antidepressants. And then additionally, because it's not working, pharmaceutical companies are now adding antipsychotics to take with your antidepressants. And as an example, Abilify is a billion dollar per year drug. We've all heard about leaky gut. One of the reasons leaky gut is perpetuated is a lot of the triggers up here, such as low HCL or hydrochloric acid, medication, stress, infections, antibiotics, uh, mold, food allergies, etc. But the reason why our gut lining is so thin, it's actually just one cell thick is because most of our immune system or our immune cells, I think 70 to 80% is in our gut. And it's because when food gets into our system, the immune system has to determine is this a friend or is this a foe? And when the gut knows that it's a foe, it needs to start getting the immune system ready to attack. And so when you start attacking the immune system constantly with a barrage of triggers, eventually it will wear down the immune system and welcome to leaky gut. So there was a carnivore study, 2021, Harvard University published a study that surveyed over 2000 people on the health effects of a carnivore diet. These were the numbers from the carnivore study, 98% improved condition related to diabetes, 97% improved GI symptoms, 96% improved psychiatric symptoms, 93% improved or resolved obesity and excess weight. Remember, obesity can also exacerbate inflammation, 84 to 100% reduced diabetic medication use. I know there are people that say, Sugar does not cause diabetes, regardless of what caused the diabetes, we have a diet that can improve diabetic dysfunction. So while carnivore does not have a ton of studies, there are many studies using a ketogenic diet to show the reduction of inflammation. I am not going to go through every single study, but you can see all the citations below. But healthy fat and restricting sugar helps reduce inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein. 
studies demonstrate that keto diets do the following animal based diets that remove grains improve chronic disease, including in type one diabetics, zero carb carnivore diets, normalize SIBO hydrogen levels superior at lowering inflammation compared to low fat diet. Ketogenic diets benefit mitochondrial function, inflammation, dermatologic diseases, and autoimmune disease such as MS. So how are benefits with carnivore possible, especially with systemic inflammation? So carnivore reduces markers of systemic inflammation, including IL-6 and HSCR PRC reactive protein by reducing blood sugar imbalances, improving insulin resistance. It nourishes the body with nutrient dense raw material. So less enemies, more friends in the gut. It limits invader proteins and food like additives and chemicals. When you're on a carnivore diet, you're normally eating less processed foods. You're restricting plant-based foods that can cause food sensitivities and gut irritations. Every single elimination diet that is out there that is medically used and supported always includes meat at the very first strictest stage, but all of them reduce some type of plant just saying. And then the carnivore diet strengthens gut barrier function where at least 70% of the immune system resides. So what is carnivore? It is an all meat elimination diet. We have a carnivore cure elimination protocol. So I will put that again in the show notes. It goes from very strict from ruminant meat, salt and water. And then over time, it graduates to include all of the foods that you see here. Essentially, if you want to think of it really simply, it's eating everything that's not part of the plant kingdom. So remember this graphic from earlier on, these were the sources of inflammation. So let's talk about these sources of inflammation from a carnivore diet perspective, gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Well, the gut starts healing with reduced food toxins. So your gut can start healing and the immune system can start getting stronger toxins, infections, environmental factors. The immune system is less busy with reduced systemic inflammation from chronic food and blood sugar imbalances. So the immune system starts to become more robust and is able to take care of other things other than discerning what food is friend or foe. Mitochondrial dysfunction, dual energy sources of ketones and glucose help to improve overall energy levels. Remember, meat or proteins have somewhat of an insulogenic effect and some of the amino acids can be used more glucose driven. So your body will do that math for you. Inadequate sleep, less hypoglycemic events in the night. So remember, when you are diabetic, you may have events in the night where all of a sudden you're sleeping, you wake up and you think, hmm, I think I need to go to the bathroom. But actually, it could be that your blood sugar is dropping. And so that's a hypoglycemic effect. And so cortisol comes in to save the day. And instead of you eating food, it raises your blood sugar so you don't die. Again, it's that tightly regulated blood levels. When you don't have these cortisol outputs that are needed or that blood sugar is so unstable, then you can get more improved sleep, more restorative sleep, less blood sugar dysregulations in the middle of the night, which will then wake you up. And if you wake up and you're wide awake in the middle of the night, it's because cortisol is normally used to run away from a predator, but it actually just was released so that your blood sugar becomes more stable. But now you are awake. Insulin resistance, carbohydrate restriction helps to restore insulin imbalances. And you can measure that by measuring your fasting insulin or the comparative C peptide. Excess stress, carnivore reduces blood sugar dysregulation. It helps to better manage cortisol and helps to balance blood sugar crashes that contribute to stress. That is why we don't feel hangry as often when we are on a carnivore or low carb diet. And then AGEs due to elevated blood sugar. Remember, we said that's another factor of inflammation. Well, carbohydrate restriction helps to balance blood sugars, reducing the overall AGEs that cause inflammation. And then poor diet, ultra processed foods, seed and vegetable oils, not part of a carnivore diet. So if we just were to summarize this overall source of inflammation, you can see how carnivore diets support the reduction of inflammation overall. Now, one thing people will say is, well, I'll just eat a plant based diet. I mean, if I was vegan, I would have low inflammation too, because many of those factors may not be there. Well, one other source of inflammation is plant toxins or anti nutrients. So removing plants helps to reduce chronic low grade inflammation in the body, gluten causes GI distress, 
for many as it is one of the most difficult plant proteins to digest. It's not just people with celiac. Many people do better without gluten. And if you're not sure if gluten affects you, you can do a GI map or a stool test and test your anti-gliadin IgA to see if you are actually sensitive to gluten. What we've seen in our practice is that when people eat even smaller doses of bread or carbohydrates that have gluten in it, you will see that marker start going up and it's a sign of inflammation. Lectins are found in legumes, beans, peanuts, soybeans, and whole grains, again, wheat. They interfere with nutrient digestion and absorption of calcium, iron, phosphorus, and zinc. Lectins are notorious for surviving the GI tract and then causing damage to that thin cell wall lining. Again, there are hundreds of different anti-nutrients in plants. There are more plants we cannot eat than there are plants that we can eat. If we know that we are all somewhat bio-individually different, there will be certain plants that we cannot tolerate because it will cause additional inflammation in the body. Phytic acid is another one. It's in whole grains, legumes, seeds, some nuts. It decreases the absorption of iron, zinc, magnesium, copper, phosphorus, and calcium. So imagine eating this big bowl salad of greens and all these nuts and seeds. How much of the iron from spinach are you truly absorbing? There was one study that showed that if you didn't eat porridge, it improved iron absorption. So little babies that may be suffering from anemia, maybe we stop feeding them oatmeal. Oxalates are a very interesting anti-nutrient. So oxalates are made both in the body and they are also from plant-based foods. They are a major cause of kidney stones. Oxalates are found in leafy vegetables such as spinach, turmeric, soybeans, and they bind to calcium and iron. Oxalates are enzyme inhibitors, so they stop the body from having proper digestion. And oxalates are actually exacerbated with mold. So this is just a pro tip. If you feel like you have been eating a low carb carnivore diet for so long, and you are still oxalate dumping after even a year, I would look into mold as mold can contribute to more oxalates within the body. So here's another example of the oxalate pathway. You see right here, this is where oxalate is produced. Vitamin C or excess vitamin C can cause oxalate production within the body. So can yeast and fungi. This is your beers. This can also be from mold. And then you see right here, the diet that can also affect vitamin C. Oxalate diets are just one path of producing oxalates. And you see right here, there's ethylene glycol, which is also alcohol. And then you also see glycine. And this is where I also say you don't want to eat too many protein shakes, but you want to just eat natural meats because protein gelatin can convert to hydroxyproline, which then can go down all these pathways and also produce oxalates. One way to reduce oxalates in general is just to not eat the very, very rich plant-based foods that have oxalates, such as almonds, turmeric, and spinach. And it's ironic that we recommend turmeric for reduction of inflammation when in fact turmeric has higher amounts of oxalates, which then actually produce inflammation. Most anti-nutrients bind to minerals. Most non-organic plants cause the soils to become depleted of nutrients. And you'll see right here, there are nutritional changes in foods just in 30 years. So when we think that we're eating a ton of apples with so much nutrition, is it really nutrient dense when there are anti-nutrients in some of these foods that then bind to our minerals, even if the label says that those minerals are present in that food, just a quick touch on kale. So we think of kale as such a superfood, but let's talk through it. Kale is super high in oxalates. It is a hyper accumulator of heavy metals. Thallium and cesium have been found. It often still contains residues of nicotine substance used as an insecticide. Think about kale and the leaves. It is so hard to remove whatever was on it because the leaves itself just protect. It's kind of rough. So how do you really clean that off? There's often sprays such as dactyl and other insecticides that are known to be toxic to the nervous system and carcinogenic that are on the remains of kale. Kale is also very high in anti-nutrients such as glucosinolates. It is part of environmental working groups, dirty dozen with the foods with the highest pesticide residues. And then it also contains thiocyanate that competes with iodine. A deficiency in iodine can affect every single cell in your body as most cells have iodine in it. So who decided that kale is a superfood? 
And even if we were to get the organic varieties, some of these, remember, organic doesn't mean that they don't use some type of herbicide to protect the plant. They still use it. They just use organic and natural varieties. But organic and natural can still be harmful if it remains on the plant. Another source of inflammation is vegetable oil. So since 1970 to 2018, seed oils have increased by 89% in terms of consumption and availability. Seed oils cause inflammation and oxidative stress because they are unstable fats. So seed oils are heated, they create oxidation products such as acrolein, which is a carcinogen and aldehyde. And then these unstable oils add more free radicals. Remember, we talk about those radicals to the body, which then cause that chronic low grade inflammation. And these are all the steps of creating canola oil. As an example, they use pre bleach, hydrogenation, post bleach. So they use bleach two times. There's de-waxing, fractionation, they use deodorization, because in case your fat smells rancid, you don't have to smell it. Then they use plastization, shortening. So that's why when you use seed oils, they don't smell like anything. And they're very crystal clear because they do a lot of things such as caustic refining and degumming. Whereas if you were to eat tallow in itself, which has been demonized for way too long, it is just cooking the meat and bones, and then collecting the fat to cool. Now there is a fear of cholesterol. Since 2015, there's no upper limits of cholesterol or dietary cholesterol. So they quietly removed it from dietary guidelines. So there is no more cholesterol limits. Statins is another topic. Half of the people that have heart attacks tend to have normal levels of cholesterol. Heart disease is a new illness. Back in the day, even 100 years ago, it was very hard to sell EKG machines because no one was having heart attacks. Long, long ago, there was no such thing as kale, no such thing as kohlrabi. These are all new things, yet we blame saturated fats and animal foods as the culprit of causing heart disease. Then we try to lower cholesterol, which again, 60% of the brain is cholesterol. And most of the cholesterol in our body is produced by itself. So why would your body uses its raw materials to produce something if it's so toxic for us? And one thing we don't discuss enough is that statins come with so many health risks muscle wasting, cognitive impairment, heart failure. This page shares all the risks of low cholesterol as well as the role of cholesterol. And it showed that long-term persistence of low cholesterol increases the risk of death. The earlier that patients start to have lower cholesterol concentrations, the greater the risk of death. Cholesterol is produced by almost every cell in the body. So again, if cholesterol was so toxic, why would your body be producing it? Cholesterol in the cell membrane, so every outer layer of cells is purposely waterproof, so it decides what goes in and out of the cell. That's why we have sodium potassium pumps, so these cells can regulate how much sodium or potassium should be in this fine state. And cholesterol, the outer layer, is what helps maintain that barrier. Cholesterol is nature's repair substance. So when we have a heart event and you see cholesterol there, it's because the cholesterol was going there to try to repair the inflammation. It is a bystander of the heart attack event, not the cause or culprit of it. Cholesterol supports us with bile salts needed to digest fats. It's a precursor of vitamin D, powerful antioxidant that protects us against free radicals and LDL cholesterol helps actually fight infections. Now, I know some people will say that we can get our protein from our plant-based proteins, but they are not the same. We do not have a requirement for protein. We have a requirement for amino acids, and there are eight or nine essential amino acids that we need to get from our foods. And that is a nuance that plant-based proteins do not share. In the United States, about 300,000 people, predominantly women, fall and break their hip annually. Of those, 50% will never walk again, and 33% of the 300,000 will die in that year. A primary cause of broken bones is due to less muscle to cushion the fall and also even bone structure, whereas protein and exercise and amino acids from mostly meat can help maintain muscle mass and bone strength. This is a protein digestibility score. While we talk about protein from plant-based foods to be the same, it is not the same. They have multiple tests that you can do to see how much are you digesting and then absorbing of the proteins and the amino acids. And you could see gluten does not have the same absorption rate of whole eggs. 
as we talked about, plant-based proteins miss some of the amino acids. So they are called the limiting amino acid. For example, if you're eating a plant-based protein, and these are the different amino acids we need, and their lysine is on the lower end, your synthesis of the different amino acids will stop at where the limiting amino acid is. So if lysine is the limiting amino acid, it will stop synthesizing proteins at that point. Carnivores don't really know this because we don't need to know this as there are no real limiting amino acids in meat. And we never have to worry about not having an abundance of amino acids. If you look right here, this has the PD cast and dias, which is the absorption utilization and digestibility scores of certain meats and then certain plant based proteins. And you see here milk protein is up there whey protein is up there. Now whey pea protein is up there in a sense. And that is the logic or even soy protein. It's up there to argue that therefore plant based proteins are safe. But then when you consider the limiting amino acid, and they are very low in cysteine and methionine, that's when we come into trouble of you're not getting all of the amino acids. So therefore your synthesis of proteins and enzymes start stalling. And I think that is why a lot of vegans start looking frail because they are losing muscle mass because they are being limited by their amino acid in their plant based proteins. So all to say, if one essential amino acid is missing, the body is unable to carry out the remaining processes for optimal health. If we understand the importance of protein, here's examples of 25 grams of protein, no one eats three cups of quinoa, which would be the 25 grams. And remember, again, this doesn't consider digestibility absorption, it doesn't consider limiting amino acids. There's a lot of messaging about how we should be eating fruits because fruits are nature's candy, but modern fruits is not the fruit that nature naturally made. Again, think about the one banana factor. So if back in the day, they had one banana a day, and that was their carb intake, are you eating eight bananas a day? In my carnivore cure book, I talked about how organic isn't necessarily better. You'll see right here, these are all the pesticides used for organic farms. They use many, many more pounds and pounds per acre. So they use the pesticides more frequently. And while glyphosate is very toxic, some of these such as spinosad has been so beneficial, they've been making spinosad into the synthetic version and just selling it as is as it works so well. Just because it's organic doesn't necessarily mean it's that healthy. This is a list of the most nutrient dense foods. So again, if you have poor gut function, which is where your immune system lies, you want your foods to have the most nutrient density so that for every bite, you're getting the best bang for your buck. Animal based foods are in the form that your body can absorb and it gives you sufficient nutrients and proteins and fats to support your hormones, to support muscle health, bone health. And then it also gives a break on your immune system to stop giving excess inflammation and just start absorbing so that it can do a better job at everything else that the immune system needs to function. I will give you this presentation so you can take a look yourself, but we talk about different minerals. We talk about ribeye and I circled the nutrients that are the most nutrient dense per food. So ribeye, for example, it has a lot of selenium, has a lot of B6. Pork has a lot of thiamine, niacin as well. Now, all of them have a lot of iron, has a lot of the B vitamins, so I didn't circle everyone. Otherwise, I truly should circle every single nutrient in every single food. Salmon has a lot of the minerals, potassium, selenium, omega-3s, vitamin C. If you think of our illnesses and our toxic load, so where basically the immune system breaks and your immune system now, whether it's food, environment, medication, exposure to something, stress, now makes you unwell we have to figure out how to reduce that bucket. Trauma affects this bucket. Medications, heavy metals and chemicals, chronic stress, toxic food, toxic environment. The goal is for each individual person to figure out what is making your bucket full. And that part is mostly individualized, but the toxic food one is the easiest one that we can regulate by ourselves. We have seen almost 2000 carnivores in our practice that reduce their insulin level, C peptide, blood sugar, fibrinogen, ferritin, thyroid antibodies by simply changing their diet and supporting gut function. We can support the body and strengthen the body by reducing the overflow 
And one way is by cleaning up our diet. We have less systemic, low dose, all the time on inflammation. Our mental health starts healing because our gut starts healing and we start nourishing the body so that we can then have our immune system take care of the other things. So many people that now on a carnivore diet don't suffer as much from seasonal allergies because your immune system is healing that it can now focus on combating the seasonal allergies and it doesn't get as affected. We talk about antioxidants in plant-based foods and therefore we need that. But if we're reducing the inflammation, why do we need a lot of antioxidants? In fact, too many antioxidants can take the reverse role and become pro-oxidants and actually cause more inflammation. We don't need a lot of antioxidant foods if we are eating foods that don't cause inflammation in the first place. There are many amino acids that act like antioxidants. Salmon, the azadanthin, the reddish color on salmon and salmon roe, it's an antioxidant. So we have it in meats as well. If we understand that chronic low dose inflammation is a big culprit in causing systemic illnesses, we can do a service to our body by eating a low inflammatory diet. Carnivore not only has so many nutrients for the body in the way that it can be assimilated and absorbed, it gives your immune system a rest by giving friend foods instead of faux foods. And then it gives you enough proteins to do the synthesis of amino acids that your body actually needs. It gives you the fats that will support your hormones. And then as your gut heals, it will support your mental health because less leaky gut means less leaky brain. And then as you heal, you can figure out, do I want to add more plants? Do I want to add different meats? But that is your individual choice. Eating meat or mostly meat has always been on the table for however long we've been around. And it is so ironic that we think plants are the answer to making us less inflammatory. When in fact, most people that eat a big bowl salad, most people have gut discomfort. Just think about that for a second. You could do a trial just on your own. Eat one meal with just meat. You don't have to eat a lot of fat because your body might not be used to it. But see how your gut feels. And then separately, eat just one big bowl salad of just veggies and make it super nutrient dense with your kales and spinach and beans and seeds. And tell me which one makes your gut feel better. We have tried every single plant-based variety of diets. We've done the Mediterranean diet. We've done all these different elimination diets. But at a certain point, we have to understand that it's not really working. We have more mental illness. We have more people with chronic illness, more people suffering every single day. So it's time at a certain point that if it's not working, maybe the tools we have are wrong. And even if carnivore sounds crazy, just give it two, three months and try it. And if you don't feel better, you can always go back to where you are today. But if you are suffering from chronic illness, trust me on it, it can change your life. And you may have to fine tune and tweak. And you may even then realize that maybe the diet itself is not the only issue. But you have to start somewhere. We have to get to root cause healing by focusing on a diet and reducing the noise that we're putting on our immune system. We can start getting answers and we can start living a life that we were meant to. And this is why I believe that the carnivore diet is the most anti-inflammatory diet. And we are trying to prove that in an upcoming carnivore study. And I'm super excited because finally, if we know that disease starts with inflammation, well, then what do you say if carnivore shows that it reduces inflammatory markers? Just something to think about. All right, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.